and is a time of great peril and great promise. The transformation we need to meet the challenges before us is radical and of a vast scale. It demands fundamental changes to social, political and economic structures, but also deep shifts in mindsets, worldviews and consciousness. Over the next four weeks, we'll ask, how can we realize the deep shifts in both socio-political structures and consciousness needed to make this transformation in a way that also looks at the inequity of our starting points? We will seek the places where political realities collide with paradigm shifting insights, and we're gonna step from radical critique into pathways for radical transformation. So in the coming three sessions, we're going to look at three key dimensions of the transformation needed. And in our fourth week, we're going to draw them together to discuss resilience and regenerative activism. So Ruby was going to be introducing our first session today on the new economy in more detail. But just to whet your appetites, she will be discussing fundamental transformation of our economic system with some of the most inspirational thinkers and activists on this topic. Next week, we're going to be looking at climate justice, identity and power. So climate change remains one of the greatest threats to humanity, one of the greatest ever faced. We will be discussing whether the problem is just as much about power dynamics and our economic and social systems and political systems also, as it is about the environment. We'll be delving into climate histories. We'll be looking at how to address the inequities and difficulties faced by frontline and vulnerable communities and considering how to build in both personal and systemic resilience into our climate responses. And on week three, our focus is gonna be on rights of nature and the more than human world. So much of Western society is geared around the assumption that humans are above and superior to the rest of the living beings on this planet. We will be looking at how this view could be contributing to the dysfunctional society we're currently living in and what legal and cultural frameworks exist that could lead us to a fuller understanding of our relationship with nature. So we'll be discussing societies and systems that view rivers and forests as having value in their own right, and perhaps even being sacred, and what difference it might make to our planetary well-being if, we, if more societies were to shift to this kind of a, approach. So in week four, we're going to pull together the threads of the weeks that have passed, and we will ask, how does the interplay between the personal, the interpersonal and the political inform our strategies for resilience and vice versa? So hopefully this has given you a good map of the terrain which we're going to adventure over the next few weeks. And we're very excited to have you with us on the journey. And I'm now gonna hand over to Ruby for the new economy panel. Hi everyone, my name is Ruby. Thank you, Gita, for that framing. Um, so, as Gita's been mentioning, how we treat ourselves, each other, and the environment are all very interlinked. And nowhere is this clearer than when we look at ourselves and our society through the lens of our economic relationships. Currently, the structure of our deregulated and globalized economic system is driving environmental destruction, inequality, atomization, and alienation. And this is the constellation of challenges that new economic thinking tries to face. So this evening we're bringing together a panel with three inspiring activists and economists who are facing these challenges. Um, and as the event was due to take place in person, they're all currently speaking from the UK. Um, each of them is developing approaches to systemic transformation, asking deep questions about the assumptions and beliefs that drive the system and the specific structural changes that are needed. Um, so the speakers are Anne Pettifer, Sean Chamberlain and Fran Wait. So Anne is um, an advisor of governments and organisations on economic policy and she's published many books, including the most recent Production of Money and The Case for the Green New Deal. So Anne was a key member of the working group developing the idea of the Green New Deal since 2007, an idea that's currently providing the central framework for progressive policy development aimed at a just transition beyond fossil fuels dependence. Prior to the Green New Deal, she was one of the co-founders of the Jubilee 2000 and played a key role in writing off debt of some of the world's poorest countries. Her, her work focuses on the global financial system, sovereign debt restructuring, restructuring international finance and sustainable development. Um, second speaker is Sean Chamberlain, um, and he works under the name of Dark Optimism. He was one of Extinction Rebellion's first RSDs and has been involved with the Transition Towns Network since its inception. 
authoring the movement's second book, The Transition Timeline. He's also managing director of the Fleming Policy Centre and former chair of the Ecological Land Cooperative. In 2016, he brought David Fleming's Lean Logic to posthumous publication and drew from it the popular paperback Surviving the Future, Culture, Carnival and Capital in the Aftermath of the Market Economy. He is the executive producer of the new film, the sequel, What Will Follow Our Troubled Situation, Civilization, and teaches Sterling College's online program, Surviving the Future, Conversations of Our Time. And our third speaker is Fran, who is executive director of Positive Money, which is a non-profit think tank which campaigns for systemic change of the money and banking system to support a fair, sustainable and democratic economy. She's a senior fellow at the Finance Innovation Lab, has advised Rethinking Economics, Commonwealth, and sits on several boards, including Finance Watch. She's also a Kundalini yoga teacher and stood as the Labour Party candidate in Gloucester in the last UK general election. So in the course of the evening, we're going to be exploring economic um, structural change and the interplay this, this has with value systems, personal and community resilience. We're going to speak to each of the panelists individually, before opening out into a broader conversation on some of the key themes that arise. And then there's going to be um, a break, a time for just journaling refre reflection. Um, and then we're going to come back together for some breakouts um, where we'll pose a few different questions to explore in small groups. Um, and then we're going to open up for um, Q&A with the speakers. So please do think about questions um, as they arise and you can either write them in the chat box or save them for later um, because there'll be plenty of time for, for unpicking some of this further. Um, one of the biggest things I think that is that a lot of us are really struggling with at the moment is just kind of coming to deeply understand how our economic system currently works. Um, and one of the key aspects of Positive Money's work is focused on educating the public um, around where money comes from, how the banks work, often exposing us to many inaccuracies even within university level education. So the, to open up the evening, I'd love, Fran, for you to get us all onto the same page and explain how the economy and banking system are working um, and the vision that Positive Money have for a fairer and more sustainable democratic economy. Sure thing. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Ruby. Really good to be here this evening with so many people tuning in from all over the world. Um, I guess I'll start with a disclaimer, which is uh, that, you know, uh, Positive Money focuses on money and banking, which we see as a really key part of the dysfunctioning of the economy, but it's definitely not the only thing. And there's a lot more that sits outside of the, the things we focus in on, um, which, you know, is, is leading us to such social and environmental problems um, because we do have a very dysfunctional economy on lots of levels. Um, but the three things I'm going to focus in on uh, today are around money creation, as you mentioned, around um, fiscal policy, which is what the government does, and monetary policy, which is what the Central Bank, Bank of England does in the UK, um, and a bit at the end around democratising money, because um, Ruby asked me to focus in on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we were founded actually 10 years ago, um, as a result of the, the financial crash and, you know, citizens having a lot of questions, but there not being many answers um, in the public sphere coming from, you know, economics, um, professors, academics. Um, uh, obviously, Anne was one of the people that was, uh, was giving people answers. Um, but Positive Money was one of the organisations that was kind of founded as a response to that. One of the key questions that we were highlighting is looking at how money is created. So how um, in the build up to the crash, um, banks were creating vast amounts of money uh, and that was going into uh, areas which, were, which then kind of resulted in a, in a destabilisation and ultimately a, a global financial crash. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, Ruby, economics textbooks at the time were quite um, misleading, if you like, around, around money creation. They kind of would say um, banks uh, take money from savers and they lend to borrowers. Um, when actual fact, um, what happens is when a, when a bank makes a loan, that 
creates money there and then um, and creates a debt at the same time. So pretty much all of the, the money in the economy and the kind of digital money we use with our debit cards and credit cards is bank created um, money and debt. Um, and the, the issue with that is obviously it's a, pa- a lot of power in the, in the bank hands in terms of direction of 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 where the economy goes um and it matters where they lend so in the uk we have um a very concentrated banking sector uh, which i'll talk a little bit more about in a moment but their their lending goes primarily into um financial and property markets which obviously results in the uk being quite skewed towards an oversized finance sector uh, and property bubbles specifically on the south uh, east of the uk and, and that you know results in this instability um, so we're not banks aren't lending to kind of socially or environmentally useful things and this is the same kind of across the world um, you know, London is being one of the bigger financial centres um, means that we've got a kind of disproportionate problem in the UK um, and why we kind of um, have seen, you know, worse effects in some ways um, in terms of the kind of over-reliance we have on, on this financial, deregulated financial sector. And although there has been some reform since the, the crash 10 years ago, it hasn't been um, enough and we still see um, you know very little um, of, of bank lending going to what we call kind of socially useful activity um, and, and as I mentioned the, an additional problem we have in the UK and it is similar in other places to different extents is that we have a very concentrated banking sector we have kind of five or four big banks that occupy a huge um, eight, over 80 percent of the market share and that means there's basically a monopoly um, so there's very little diversity and they're all um, kind of shareholder owned banks. So a couple of solutions to these problems are that we need a, an ecosystem of banks. So um, we need kind of uh, a national investment bank in terms of, of um run by the government and looking at kind of publicly needed projects but we also need more community level banks um, more relational banking and kind of mission driven banks that actually um, kind of see the need to grow um, the economy in certain areas and so want to get finance into those areas another idea around this issue with with bank uh, money creation is, is Um, the need for what's called kind of credit guidance. So this idea that banks shouldn't have kind of free reign if they um, create most of our money, they shouldn't get to just gamble it away, if you like, into financial and property markets. So there's a need to uh, have a kind of regulatory system which guides credit into different areas of the economy. So these are just kind of two two ideas. Um, So moving on to the second area I mentioned, um, the kind of fiscal policy and monetary policy, you know, we saw a real um, false narrative emerge, you know, 10 years ago, which was that, uh, you know, basically the government is like a household and it can't, um, it can't spend more than it takes in, um, when when actually we kind of, we know that, um, you know, if there wasn't a a state, uh, we wouldn't really have money in terms of taxation and states have central banks which are um, able to kind of create money at will and we've seen that through um, the quantitative easing pro uh, quantitative easing programs that we've seen across the world um, so i think first it's just important to realize that was a false narrative there wasn't kind of no money left and austerity which was the contraction of public spending was very much a political ideological project and we've obviously seen that come to light in um, the covid-19 crisis where um the realization that the the the, the um pandemic required governments to essentially kind of demobilize our economies um, meant that you know governments um, and central banks have had to vastly expand um, their their spending in order to make sure that we don't see people um, really slipping into um, you know debt defaults food insecurity um, and you know in extreme kind of levels of poverty and you know we're not out of the woods le- yet and there's been some you know problems with what the UK and other governments have done in terms of it not being enough. But at least we can see that this idea that there's no money is completely false. When when we have crises, you know, um, we've seen that the, the government and the Bank of England will find the money needed. 
Um, so one of the problems with quantitative easing in, in terms of how it kind of responded to the financial crash was that it was the, the Bank of England creating vast amounts of money, like hundreds of billions of pounds, and basically buying financial assets, mostly government bonds, um, which increased the wealth of the, the, of the richest. Um, and at the same time, the, the government wasn't spending. So at the moment, we're actually seeing a, a change, which is good, in terms of the, the Bank of England is buying um, government bonds from financial markets, and the government is spending um, in terms of the schemes to cover um, employment salaries um, that, we've, that we've seen coming out, and that's happening in different ways in, in different countries. Um, and that's good, but what positive money advocating is that we could go further, which is we don't necessarily need to go through financial markets, um, which again tends to result in a wealth transfer to the richest. The, the Bank of England or other central banks could buy directly from governments their, their debt um, and directly do some kind of form of direct monetary financing. Um, yeah, so, so there are lots of different ways that we can actually um, kind of level uh, the playing field, if you like, between the creditors and the debtors. And that's something positive money are very interested in in terms of how we transition to uh, uh, a money and banking system that actually can help enable a fairer, sustainable and democratic um, economy. Uh, and just kind of finish on the kind of democratizing money um, area. So... You know, something positive money has always been very passionate about is the fact that if if basically all the money we use is created by private banks, then we have a privatized money system. And money is, you know, in terms of the pound sterling, is is kind of a monopoly. So that's not a, a good place to be in terms of them having all of the power. Um, we do have cash, which is publicly used, um, and Positive Money has campaigned to protect access to cash because it is on the decline. It's it's on the decline around the world, and there are a lot of private interests, um, Visa and Mastercard big banks who are really interested in seeing us moving to a totally cashless society, not just so they'll kind of control the money kind of completely, but also so that they can um, increase their data harvesting of um, kind of all of the payments we make, um, which I think is a, is a concerning place for us to be as democracies or, you know, but, you know, we're kind of still democracies. Um, and, one big concern that has kind of brought this into the spotlight has been Facebook saying it wants to release its own currency, Libra. Um, and on the face of it, you might seem that's harmless, but obviously Facebook has had a massive issues with, with privacy um, and kind of being accountable um, to democracies. And I think that, you know, when you look at who's behind Libra, you see the kind of key players are there, Visa, MasterCard, other big corporates. Um, and this has really kind of kicked central banks and governments to an extent into action to think, OK, you know, we could um, kind of potentially lose control, if you like, of the system. Um, and what positive money is advocating is that we need a public payment system. So we need a kind of digital version of cash, which is a, you know, a public form of, of, of money, of means of payment. But we also need a public payment system to back that up and actually that will help to keep uh, money in public ownership where as citizens we can have kind of accountability and scrutiny over it and stop it kind of creeping into this ever kind of privatized um, sphere of not just our money but our payments and our data um, so that's also something we've been pushing since the, the crash. And actually, one, just one aspect of that is that it could be a way of um, facilitating a, a, some kind of UBI or direct payment to households, uh, which, which I think is also an important part of the transforming the economy um, towards a, a more fair, more democratic, and more sustainable one. Um, so I'll end there. Thanks so much, Fran. Like, you touched on so many... Um, things particularly what stands out for me most is these two models so if we were to summarize a bit there's the oversized finance sector which is privatized money um, deregulation and the alternative to that would that be public ownership public public governmental state involvement within the economy more than the current system 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that we do need to um, realise that the, the, the kind of the private sector as it is in, in terms of finance and money is becoming ever more concentrated and ever more powered. So we do need to kind of tip the balance and shift that back to having um, it um, more in the public sphere. So having um, more regulation, um, you know, of the financial sector, not just banks, but things like shadow banks, um, insurance companies and, and you know hedge funds and, and obviously um, thinking about the stock market um, but also the fact that basically you know central banks and governments have the power to um, to do a lot more to get us towards a, a more sustainable and more fair democratic economy but obviously there's not always the political will there um, but I think that what we're seeing now with the kind of um, you know, absolute crises that we're in is that, you know, private sector companies, big banks, they're not going to fix this. The state has to step in. Um, and so, you know, I saw on Twitter someone saying, you know, we're all socialists in a crisis. And so we have to kind of recognise the the actual role of the state in transitioning the economy um, to, you know, to a more equitable, to a, a fairer um, and more democratic one. Uh, it's a it's a really key one. There's only so much people can do from the kind of bottom up, and um, we do need to use those big power, um, the big levers of power, if we're really going to transition. Yeah, and when you talk about um, the when we talk about regulation or deregulation, are we talking about regulating what the banks invest in? So that's one of the things I suggested. So credit guidance is an idea that's kind of gained traction. So, you know, 80% of new loans go into property and financial markets in the UK. Um, there's no reason why there couldn't be some kind of regulation to say, you know, half of that you know, should be the case or, um, or it could, you know, be kind of quantitative. But I think... Um, you know, and, and another issue around property markets is um, the inflow of of money from you know around the world to see kind of London property as a safe asset, um, and and there could be re regulations to stop that being allowed to happen. So you know, since the kind of eighties, we've seen deregulation, and and obviously a lot of people were hopeful post crash ten years ago that we would kind of re-regulate. That's not really happened to the extent. Um, that people hoped and, and broadly speaking the kind of the regulation has been around how do we make banks fail better rather than how do we stop banks failing and make them more socially useful um, so there's a real issue there in terms of regulation hasn't been has been around risk management um, of a system rather than saying the system should be designed to do better stuff for society. Otherwise, we've just got a pretty broken system that just keeps making the rich richer. Um, so that's something that we that we kind of um, also try and highlight and focus in on. And then just quickly, what would the relate? Because now we're talking a lot about state state involvement within the within the economy. Would what and the current system with deregulation is often very globally globally facing glo globalized economy so what is the relationship then between a nationally versus a globally oriented economy um so i think that um you know if you think about the Lon city of london like that um has to come from the you know the uk government um but there is need for if you like a kind of a new international settlement um and, you know and probably possibly more um more of an expert than me in this area but there's ideas around kind of a new Bretton woods where you know we actually realize that global um financial markets have been highly damaging and not really socially useful and they've been quite destructive especially in the last couple of decades so kind of internationally we want to be looking at a um a settlement that you know looks to kind of um at least stop them be you know being quite as as kind of powerful and actually how you kind of re-regulate them and i think that is a, an important part of the 
um, puzzle as well because you know it's going to be very hard for say London the city of London to kind of go it alone into like there's a lot of things that we should be doing um, but you know uh, Wall Street, if Wall Street is still kind of the deregulated financial capital centre, then it's going to be hard to get the City of London to, um, uh, yeah, or governments to have that kind of the power to to re-regulate. But it is possible. Um, so I think we need both national and international um, political will in order to kind of um, make finance the the servant and stop being the master, which it currently sadly is. Mm-mm. Thank you so much, Fran. Um, I'd love to talk to Anne a bit now um, because and the in the last few years, the idea of the Green New Deal and its efforts to implement structural change into the economy has broken into mainstream awareness and has been taken up in many countries in many different forms. Um, And I'd love for you to give us just a brief introduction into what the Green New Deal is and why it's important. Is she here? Oh, Anne, you're on mute. I'm mute. Okay, I'm unmuted now, yeah? Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for having me on um, and for organizing this um, and for even thinking about this because thinking is a really important part of the change that we need to make. So the Green New Deal originated back in 2007 because a group of us came together, environmentalists, economists, and entrepreneurs working on solar energy, and um, journalists, and uh, we were determined to begin to think about system change. We know about, you know, refuse, reuse, recycle, reduce, and rot. But those things on their own are not enough. And what we wanted to see was structural change. So what's key to the Green New Deal is the need for structural change to the system. And that was quite hard for us to do. We spent, I don't know, about six months gathering every so often in my flat in London and having terrific arguments because... The environmentalists and people working on the ecosystem were very focused on their work. Those of us working on monetary theory and on macroeconomic policy were very focused on that. And and marrying these two were, was hard. You know, we had these terrific rows, and we still do. We have huge rows still and disagreements. But in the end, our arguments actually ended up by, were sort of resolved within this report that we wrote in, published in 2008 at the height of the great financial crisis. And essentially we were saying that if we were to, if we are to address the threat that is posed to the ecosystem by climate breakdown and earth systems breakdown essentially, um, then we must change the economic system and that the economic system and the ecosystem are tightly integrated and it's no good talking about one without to, without the other. I hope I'm speaking, I hope I see there's some comments about non-English speakers not being able to follow. So I hope this is this makes sense to people. So we had this tremendous argument about how to integrate these these two things. And I think that is what's unique about the Green New Deal as it emerged in 2008. Um, it's new, it's, you know, it, it is now taken shape both in the United States, but also in Europe with the Green Deal. And every new version of it, of course, has slight variations. No, some, some of them are really rather big variations. But, but fundamental to the original version is the notion of structural change to the financial system. And we were particularly concerned to transform the financial system because we believe that it has a very strong impact on the ecosystem. And if I could explain that simply, um, the rate of interest is the price, if you like, of a loan. But it's it's, um, very different from any other prices because it's a price that can change and it's a price whose whose cost can rise exponentially. If If you default on your loan, the uh, creditors able to compound interest. And the, the compounded interest is a, is a mathematical concept. You know, it can rise exponentially uh, and mathematically. The earth and the earth's resources are not mathematical. They are physical and they are finite. 
And the second law of thermodynamics is absolutely fundamental to the, to the functioning of, of the Earth's systems. And that's in conflict. That, that, that mathematical process and that physical process are in conflict. So if you're going to, as Fran has explained, create debt, create loans willy-nilly, um, without any regard for the price of those loans and the impact of that price on the ecosystem, you're going to get the kind of, kind of chaos that we're living through right now. Oh, sorry. And, um, and so what we wanted to explain was that these two things are really closely intertwined and, and are, are, you know, to change one, we need to change one in order to be able to affect the other. Now, that's quite a hard concept for most people because as Fran has tried to explain, the monetary system is not well understood and positive money have played a very big part in, in helping to spread understanding. And when we published this in 2008, nobody in the world had any idea what the, what the thing called quantitative easing was. And uh, I have to tell you that, that you were not alone because um, there were many economists and part of our beef is with mainstream ec economics. Most economists didn't really understand the monetary system. And as Fran has explained, even the most senior economists, even the most progressive economists, uh, like Mr. Paul Krugman on the New York Times, you know, argued that savers put their money in the bank and then the bank acts as intermediary between those savers and borrowers. And of course, that hasn't been the case since 1694 when uh, the Bank of England was founded and when, it was, when credit was created. And as David Graeber has shown in his wonderful book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, we've had credit system since the beginning of time, credit system since the beginning of time. And a credit system is based on the word credo, I believe. I believe you will pay for, your, for what you're doing. And, and that is what money is. <clears throat> money is nothing more than a promise to pay, as Joseph Schumpeter once explained. So if you think about it in ancient times, 5,000 years ago, in a little village, you know, there'd be someone who could cut hair, and gee, I wish I knew someone who could cut hair right now. And then there would be someone in the village who could thatch roofs. And the, they would come together and, and, and someone would say, well, and one would say, look, I'll cut your hair if you'll thatch my roof. And the key thing that has to happen in such a monetary system where we make promises to each other is that there has to be a third party upholding those promises. And so in the village, it would have been the chief or the high priest. There would have been someone who kept tabs on the promises that had been made in these transactions. So I would cut your hair and then could I rely on you to thatch my roof in exchange? That, that holding of the promise was the job of the regulator, who was the priest or the chief of the village. And that is how money, money systems have operated since the beginning of time. And so we've developed ways of, of, of uh, symbolizing those promises. You know, the pound note, 10 pound note says on it, the dollar bill says on it, I promise to pay, right? And the, the, the dollar bill is simply an, an, an evidence of my promise. When I go into a coffee shop, which I can't do anymore, and wave a card at a machine, the card says, you know, you can trust Anne Pettifor to pay five pounds for a cup of coffee and a croissant in the center of London. That's all it does. It just says that, that you can trust, you, you can trust Anne Pettifor to pay this. And the same with a credit card. There's no money. You'll all know this from your own experience. There's no money in the bank, uh, in your credit card account. You don't put your savings, some people do, of course, but you don't put your savings in your credit card account. You go to the store and you buy perhaps a washing machine and you hand over your credit card. And the credit card says, and pitiful promises to pay for a washing machine. And the, the owner of the store hands back the credit card, put it back in my pocket and go home, right? And then I pay over time. And again, there's a regulator in the middle. It's the bank. The bank makes sure that I do uphold my credit card. And then behind the bank is the law to uphold those contracts, right? So this system is a great system, and it enables us, as Keynes famously said, to do what we can do. If we have to bail out the banking system, if we have to pay the salaries of, I don't know how many million people in Britain are having their salaries paid at the moment, the monetary system enables that to happen. If we have to 
find the money to save the climate, we can do that. The limitations we face are not the actual symbols of our promises, but our ability to promise. Can we promise? Can we really do this? Can we save the, the, the ecosystem? Can we tackle climate breakdown? Can we do so? Can we stop the temperatures, the, the global temperature rising above 1.5 degrees? Can we do that? If we can do that, then the monetary system exists to enable us to do it. That's what it's for. The problem with that, and I think Fran has pointed this out, the problem with this is that we set up a monetary system, if you think of ourselves as a village with a regulator, and some big bad guys come and take it over, right? And when the regulator in the middle has been looking after our savings, if we've made a surplus on this exchange that we had with the guy who could thatch roof and so on, they've grabbed those, they've grabbed those, and they're now running the system, and they're now enforcing or making us do whatever they want us to do. So, so there's a... There's a, a real issue around the monetary system. It is actually something that was evolved with civilization, that evolved with civilization, but it's being captured. It's being captured by the 1%. It's being captured by Wall Street, and it's being captured by the city of London and Frankfurt and so on. So the real task that we face, if we want to tackle climate breakdown, is we've got to, we've got to regain power democratic power over the monetary system. That, that, Fran is absolutely right. That's our central task. And it's a hard thing to do. And most of us aren't interested, really, in gaining political power to do that. And one of my beefs at the moment is that the left and many Greens find politics and political power very distasteful. And I have to tell you, it is. <laughs> you only have to watch Donald Trump, Donald Trump or, or Boris Johnson to think, I don't want to be one of those guys, right? I don't want to be in that kind of world. But we have to. We have to get there. We have to seize political power if we want to transform the system. So that's, so the Green New Deal is about that. And then fundamentally at the heart of the Green New Deal, is the notion that we, we face finite limits. We can't exponential growth. Growth is not a thing we can even contemplate. Growth as it's understood by neoliberal economists, and I, I want to talk about that perhaps later. You know, there are, there are limits to what we can do. There are limits to the extent to which we can exploit the ecosystem. There, there are limits to the extent to which we can go to the Congo and dig up rare earths so that we can have fancy iPhones. There are limits to that, right? So for, for us, fundamentally, at the heart of the Green New the Nation, uh, the, at the heart of the Green New Deal, is the notion that we have to live within our limits. We have to live within the constraints that the ecosystem plays on us. And to do that, we have to, we argue, become more self To do that, we have to do two things. First of all, we have to transform the international financial system. And we have to, if you, in a sense, recapture it for, for the people in the broader sense of the word. And that's a complicated story, and I won't go into too much detail here. But, but essentially, we want to domesticate the financial system. At the moment, the financial system is globalized. It's out there beyond the reach of any democratic society, of any democratic body, right? Very deliberately, the international system is designed to remove capital and to remove the financial system from oversight by governments because the founders of it, Hayek and all those neoliberals, thought the biggest threat to civilization was democratic government, essentially. Uh, they, they just didn't think governments could be trusted, and they still don't. They still find the state really uh, unacceptable. So, so we have to bring it back to the domestic, we have to domesticate the global financial system and, and bring it back within, I would say within national, but it could also be regional boundaries. We have to localize the economy in a sense and the financial system. That's going to be hard doing that. It's going to be tough. And I said in my book that the only way it would happen would be through crises. And I said in my book, which was published in September last year, that, that we could just wait there's going to be a very big shock. And when that shock comes, we will see that the existing order will be stirred up 
and it may well be transformed. Well, I didn't expect that to be a pandemic, but the shock sure has arrived. We've got the shock, right? And the shock is shaking up the international order. So, so, so it, the transformation of the international system has to take place first. We have to domesticate the financial system, and then we have to learn to live within our, 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 our boundaries, so to speak. You know, we've got to be self-sufficient. And the way I always explain that is to say that we in Britain, for example, have got to start growing our own green beans. Right now, what we do is we expect low-paid women to drain the Kenyan water table and grow green beans and then put them on an aeroplane and fly them to us so that we can have green beans 365 days of the year. No, that's got to stop, right? We've got to now start becoming more self-sufficient. Now, while we all will have to become more self-sufficient, that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be internationalist. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be acting cooperatively and collaboratively. We absolutely have to because the climate doesn't know boundaries, doesn't understand boundaries. It's global, right? And around that, we have to collaborate. Collaborate. What we're seeing happening right now is that, in particular through Donald Trump, is that the leaders of the world have decided that they're not going to cooperate, that they instead are going to become nationalistic, uh, America first, authoritarian, put up the walls, put up the protections against globalization. And uh, that's the very reverse of what we need. We need, under a Green New Deal, to be inter collaborative internationally, while at the same time being self-sufficient. And then, as uh, Fran says, we want the financial system to act as servant, to do what the society needs for us, not for us to be the slaves of you know, private equity firms, uh, um, asset management firms who control our pensions and so on and so forth. So all that has to change. And then we've got to learn how to live within, within our limits. We've got to transform. And for me, this is where, um, and the question you asked, Ruby, was perfectly pertinent. This is where the state has to come in. What we know, and we know right now, from the way the private sector system works, is that, first of all, the private sector hates free markets. It really doesn't like a free market, right? It wants to have a fixed market. And it, 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 the other thing it really hates is risk-taking. Despite all this talk about entrepreneurial capitalists who are risk-takers, no, 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 no. They want the government to guarantee everything. They want taxpayers to guarantee everything so that there's no risk associated with what they do. You know, it's the very reverse of what we are taught capitalism is all about. So that's got to change, um, and, and, and we have to understand that the private sector is too timid and too inadequate to the task of transformation of the, of the system, which means the state has to, in the first instance, transform energy, transport, and land use systems so, so that we can live in an alternative way, that we can live differently from the way we live today. So I can't, you know... I can't get around uh, easily in the countryside here because the transport system isn't designed for that. Um, you know, the public's, the, the bus service was privatized and now it doesn't run anymore. There, are, there aren't trains. There's no way, no way for me to get around easily. And so people use cars here. So the state has to provide us, has to help us transform that into other, into more sustainable transport systems. And then only then can we ask people to make big changes. Now, we're seeing what's already happening under this uh, COVID-19 is that people are already changing this stuff. Where I live, people are suddenly on their bicycles and the sale of bikes has gone up through the roof, basically. People are discovering, actually, we could get around on our own at our own efforts so that so those so the state has to transform those systems in the first instance and then enable us all to change our behavior uh, and i think this is particularly important if you look at what happened in in france was that the state said hang on a minute we're going to tax you first and when we collected your taxes then we'll 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 think about change and the people said hang on you know I've no other way of getting around. I've no other way of earning a living. And now you're taking more money from me, but you're not providing me with an alternative. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to, I'm going to resist this. And they did resist it. And in my view, quite rightly. So, um, so under a Green New Deal, 
the state would be providing the alternative and then asking people to participate in that and to to use that and they will once once they are provided with an alternative and so, you know, so i'm going on sorry let me stop there you're really not going on at all but um you mentioned that the you actually touched on a lot which i want to unpick a bit later particularly around growth um and also the relationship between um localization and global economy but also involvement within political and um, economic systems yeah. um, from the personal level but earlier on you mentioned that the money is there but I find one of the biggest things that people throw against kind of the movement to decarbonize the economy is that we need the money so mm-hmm. could you if possible quite briefly just touch on how come the money is there and then if it is there why aren't we why don't we know that well the, the thing is that if you think about <laughs> Federal Reserve right now. So I, I think I'm going to slightly disagree with Fran here because what money is, it's nothing else except a promise to pay, right? That's what money is. I promise to pay. But that promise is backed up by collateral. If I want to buy, you know, I want to buy a flat or a house, I've got to offer the bank or the state or whoever is going to give me that money collateral. And they want collateral just to guarantee that I mean what I say, right? I have to sign a contract. I promise to pay for this new house that I've bought. Thirdly, I have to pay at a rate of interest, which is a fee that the creditor charges, right? So these are the processes we go through. Now, the amount of my ability to to promise to pay depends on my ability to do that, essentially. And our ability to to make promises to pay. So what is happening today in the Federal Reserve is dishing out trillions of dollars, trillions, to the financial system. And what they're doing is taking collateral in exchange and saying to these guys, here's some more liquidity for you. You could spend it. You can use it. You can use it to pay your employees or you can use it for whatever you want to use it for. But you're going to have to repay me at some point in the future. Um, but in the meantime, here is the cash, basically. Now, the question is, do those, do those institutions have the capacity to repay? I very much doubt it, actually. I think we've got a, we're in a case here of too many promises to pay. But anyway, the answer is this, that the ability of the Federal Reserve to create money is entirely dependent on the ability of the borrowers to, 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 to agree to that, basically. And, and where I would differ with positive money is that I think the whole money process is a, is a democratic process. You know, I, um, I make up the money supply. When I apply for a loan for £300,000, I'm increasing the money supply by £300,000, really. Um, if I don't apply for a loan, and, and in the times of crisis, people don't apply for loans, the money supply shrinks. And that's bad, really, because then there isn't enough for us to be, be oiling the wheels of our, our activity, you know, cutting hair and shaving beards and, and, and uh, thatching roofs, really. Um, so, so the monetary system was designed, was built, was, has evolved to enable us to do what we can do. The question is, if we overpromise or if we promise beyond our capacity to repay, the monetary system falls over. It, it, it collapses and that that and it's about knowing the limits and knowing and that's complicated working out what the limits are but it's about that really and within those limits we can make promises to pay and and that's why there's never going to be a shortage of money but there may be a shortage of promises does that help yeah it does. thank you Anne. i just wanted to say i can hear in the background somebody's playing a um trumpet and then I realized it's eight five past eight so if anybody wants to join their um clap for carers you're welcome to do so um and in the I'm also going to now address um question to Sean um because some years ago Sean was putting a lot of energy into the transition network um, but in contrast to the Green New Deal, the transition approach pays very little attention to, well, comparatively little attention to state-level interventions and emphasizes localism, degrowth, and community. 
Um, so while there's obviously many overlaps, it's just a slightly different approach. And I'd love to, you to just share, Sean, on some of the key lessons you've learned through the project and the kind of economic restructuring that that asks for. Okay. Thanks, Ruby. Um, well, I think I'd start with a story then, uh, which is that I guess about 15 years ago, I was learning about the kinds of issues that Anne and Fran have been talking about, um, and also about climate change and about energy resource depletion, biodiversity collapse, and this whole mess that we're in. Um, and I, I found it really hard to know what to do uh, as an individual, because it seemed like there are two things we're always told to do. Uh, and one of those is personal lifestyle change, like riding a bike instead of driving in a car or not flying anymore or switching to a green energy provider. And the other one is sort of lobbying those in power, as we call them, um, you know, writing letters to your MP or, or signing petitions. And I found those both really depressing <laughs> because, um, you know, you lobby the people in power and, and nothing happens. And we carry on down this destructive path that we've been on in the 15 years since I was having those debates with myself. Uh, and you change your personal lifestyle and it feels like a drop in the ocean because it seems like the whole society's still going in the opposite direction and destroying the ecosphere and built on genocide and injustice and everything else. Um, and so when I was trying to figure out what to do about this stuff, uh, I went to a, a two week course at a place called Schumacher College down in Devon in the UK in the southwest of England. Um, and there I met David Fleming and Rob Hopkins. Uh, and David Fleming said something that really brought me up short because at the time I was thinking, okay, if I want to deal with climate change, maybe I need to get involved with the UN and, and these kind of international global level talks and everything. And he said, large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework. And the more that I've thought about that over the years since, the more it has changed everything that I do. All of my work has become about how do we build the frameworks that enable a diversity of small scale solutions? Um, because that's what we need. Uh, all of the emissions in the world are local to somewhere, uh, even if they're corporate, even if they're built in hugely exploitative systems. Um, and so the, the transition movement, uh, that was David Fleming for the person asking in chat who said that, I'll talk more about him. Uh, and so the transition movement was really uh, in large part inspired by David's sort of vision. And, and what he argued was that the problem with those two ways of acting is a problem of scale. Um, the problem with the individual lifestyle changes is that they're too small scale to, to deal with the scale of the problems. Uh, the problems with the lobbying the parliaments or MPs is that they're too large scale for you to actually have an impact. You're, you're too small to integrate with them. Uh, and so Transition thought, well, what would it look like if we created a response at the community scale, what people often call the human scale? Um, like, can we, can we try and address this sort of log jam that there is where sort of governments are saying, well, we can't do anything because the people don't really want us to do it. And the people are saying, well, we can't really do anything because the government need to act first. Um, and we thought, can we, can we stay in that, in that sort of human scale space, a scale which is small enough that we can actually have an influence that's meaningful and see our impact, but large enough that if lots of communities start fo following this path and network together, as Anne was saying, then we can create this sort of empowered wave of change. And that was our sort of approach to, um, yeah, to this dilemma that I, I was facing and I think many of us, many of us face. And uh, again, what Anne was saying about um, we need to, uh, I think she was talking about self-sufficiency at the national scale, which is sort of localization. Kate Rayworth, another friend of mine, talks about, you know, we need to localize the world of stuff because it's mad to be, flying or shipping stuff all over the world constantly, but globalize the world of, of networking and culture and solidarity. Um, and there's another line from David Fleming's work that, that really inspired transition, which is localization of stuff stands at best at the limits of practical possibility, but it has the decisive argument in its favor that there will be no alternative. And I think that's the thing. If we're going to address issues like climate change, we have to relocalize the world of stuff. There's just, there's just no other 
vaguely desirable option. Um, and so, yeah, David, who I've mentioned a couple of times, he became a real mentor for me over the next five years or so until he passed away. Um, and your question about Ruby, about economic restructuring, um, again, I just found it completely mystifying. You know, I, I'd, I'd read books by people like Anne, who's been pioneering work on this for, for decades, and I'd still be like, uh, but what's, <laughs> how do I get my hands around this? Like, how do I, how do I engage with it? Um, and I remember in 2009, I was asked to uh, write a book for the transition movement um, that was sort of researching various aspects of the challenges that we face. And when I was looking at economics, I was like, where do I even start? Like, on the one hand, I've got economists saying, as Anne was saying, you know, these are difficult times. We have to tighten our belt. We have to spend less and reduce our... And on the other hand, there are economists saying, these are difficult times. We have to spend more. We have to get the economy started. And, ah, how do I even make sense of this? And, um, and what David really did for me, David Fleming, was help me to find bedrock. Um, so as Fran was saying, like, we're so used to talking about economics in terms of finance, in terms of money. Um, but that isn't, that is one part of economics and it's a part of economics that's become vastly dominant in today's world. Um, but it's only one part. So what is economics fundamentally? Um, and may have a different definition, but the one that I use is it's determining what we do with stuff and who does what and who gets paid how much for doing what. So, you know, these are the questions that shape our day to day lives. You know, most of us have a job that takes most of our waking hours what we do and how well we get paid for that, that's an economic question. And yet, economists have sort of, absolutely excluding Anne from this, have, um, have created this world where people think economics is this mysterious, otherworldly thing that's really strange and full of mathematics and not really any of our business. Um, when actually it's about the fundamental questions of, of what we do with our days. And that doesn't have to be financial. So huge amounts of what we do with our days has got nothing to do with money at all. Like when kids are raised, they aren't raised because their parents are paid to raise them. Um, you know, I'm here giving this talk. I'm not being paid to do it. Like none of this has got anything to do with the financial economy. Finance is one way of organizing what we do with our time and what we do with our stuff. And that's really important to remember. And I think Fran and Anne have both, both emphasized that. Um, and so if we understand what economics is and that finance is only one tool for achieving the things that we want to, and an important tool, as Anne was saying, then we can start to understand the fundamental dilemma that we face today, which as we've heard is, is to do with growth. Um, and if that sounds a bit abstract, um, I would say the point, it's really just basic arithmetic and Anne knows a lot more about this than I do, but I found it really helpful to have it explained to me that, you know, we often hear that we need something like 3% growth annually to stave off recession or depression. And just simple arithmetic tells us that 3% growth a year means something doubles in 24 years. That's just basic maths. And so at the moment, we've got a world which is buckling under the weight of the human economy. Uh, the latest Living Planet report announced that 60% of the mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles have gone since 1970. Not 60% of the species, but the actual number of, of creatures. 60% have gone in the last 50 years. So put starkly, most of the wild nature that was here 50 years ago is, is gone. Um, and, and then we're, we're taking an economy that sort of pushed out so much of the natural world, made so much space for the human economy, uh, and we're talking about doubling that over the next 24 years as if that's remotely plausible or possible or desirable. And then, of course, if we were going to continue with the growth based model, it would have to double again in another 24 years. So in 50 years, we'd have an economy, four times as much economic activity, four times as much stuff going on, four times as much carbon emissions and pollution and extraction and devastation of topsoil and everything else. So this is the, the fundament, as I see it, of, of our sort of dilemma today is that on the one hand, we've got an economic system that's completely dependent on growth and we could talk more about why that is. But basically we're looking at a collapse scenario if we don't continue growing. 
But if we do continue growing, we're looking at a collapse scenario <laughs> because we're going to overwhelm and destroy the ecosystems on which we all depend. And that's, I think, the question. And I think it's really important to get the question right before we talk too much about what we need to do about it. And that was something which David Fleming really helped me understand what economics is and then what our fundamental problem is. Um, because um, my friend Kate Rayworth says sometimes that, um, you know, growth sounds, seems like a really good thing. You know, you want your kids to grow, you want your garden to grow, you want you know, your business to grow. Like, surely growth is a good thing. But if you say, I have a growth, uh, that's quite a different thing. That, then we understand that within, within the body of, a, of a, a complex system, if one part of that system wants to grow and grow endlessly, then that's a cancer, that's a disease. Um, and that, as Anne was saying, is, is, is what our monetary system is sort of turning us into. You know, it's, it's losing all respect for limits. And as Anne was saying, limits are such a fundamental concept. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, I just really wanted to start by saying, you know, that's, that's the, the essence of the problem that I think we're all discussing. And yet it's somehow, despite the fact that it's just arithmetic, it somehow remains respected mainstream opinion that we should just keep keep growing and sort of cross our fingers that somehow nature is going to defy both physics and maths and continue to bail us out forever. Um, and uh, I thought David Fleming actually summed it up quite beautifully. I think in, in his book, he said, civilizations self-destruct anyway, but it is reasonable to ask whether they have done so before with such enthusiasm and in obedience to such an acutely absurd superstition. Um, and so no doubt we're going to get more into exploring answers and approaches as we go on today. But um, I just really wanted to start with that, that basis in, um, yeah, understanding the problem that we face. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And um, I'm under the understanding that Fleming was really eloquent in um, drawing out a kind of strong cultural vision, like how can we thrive when in adversity and how can we build community resilience when everything is kind of up against us um, and I know that you're doing a course at the moment called Surviving the Future which goes into this in a bit of detail so I'd love you to share a bit of this cultural vision um, against the backdrop of what um, Fran and Anne have been talking about. Okay um, so yeah we're, we're halfway through a, a two-month course um, we've got 250 participants um, and, huh. well, I think the first thing I should say, and it, it ties in with a couple of things that someone called Maya has been saying in the chat, um, is that one of the core things in David Fleming's work, which was quite controversial when he was writing, which was decades ago, uh, and remains quite controversial is that he looked at the current situation and while he absolutely agreed with the kind of um, transition or reform or transformational approaches that Fran and Anna are talking about, and which I completely support as well. He didn't believe after 10 or 20 years of trying to work for that himself, he didn't believe we were actually going to do it. He thought that the, um, the growth imperative was so embedded in our, in our current system. Um, I mean, Kate, Kate Rayworth talks about us being financially, politically, and socially addicted to growth. And I think that's a, a decent summation. And so his work became more about not how do we transform this system, because although that's absolutely desirable, he didn't think it was really going to happen uh, on an appropriate time scale, um, but more about the fact that the thing, in his opinion, and in my opinion, that's going to bring this system to a halt, as Anne was talking about, is it collapsing under the weight of its own unsustainability, um, it making a huge number of promises that it can't keep and, and, and collapsing. Um, and from that perspective, um, he then wondered, well, okay, so this sort of growth-based, market-based model has only really been around for a couple of hundred years, and it's already approaching destroying its own foundations and falling in a big heap. So how did human beings support and sustain themselves for the couple of hundred thousand years that we existed before that? Um, and so he looked into the, the kind of history of um, humanity. Uh, and what he found was that in the absence of economic growth, what really binds communities and cultures together 
is is culture is is those shared cultural ties of of cooperation and and music and play and support and solidarity these were the uh the essence of the existence of economics not not finance but economics before um yeah before this this sort of brief historical anomaly that we've all been born into and lived our entire lives inside um so he has another lovely line he says the future economy will depend for its existence on a deep foundation in culture. It is possible to live without it, but only for a time, like holding your breath underwater. Um, and so I mean, we can talk more about this, but the, the real essence of his economics is that we need to get away from dependence on finance, stop looking for our security in money because things like pensions and secure incomes are gonna look more and more and more fragile as we go into this time. Uh, and instead look for our security in, in, in nature and in relationships in getting to know people, enjoying time together, helping, supporting each other, like the mutual aid um, systems that have been springing up all over the place. And, and as we explain in um, uh, the film that we made recently, the sequel, What Will Follow Our Troubled Civilization, in times when the financial economy um, ceases to be a reliable source of support for people, it's very natural for people to start supporting each other and relying on each other again. Um, we all know that in our personal lives, that if we fall on hard financial times, what keeps us going is our relationships and our families and our, uh, our communities. Um, and so uh, w one thing I like to say is that in many ways, this work is not so much about what we stand to lose, but to a large extent about what we've lost already as we've come into this atomizing economy, as you described it, uh, and what we could stand to regain if we, if we do things right. Um, creating that sort of taking that shared longing that we have for uh, a life with more time for for music and family and friends uh, and his economics shows how that could actually be the basis for um, the sustainable future that we absolutely need right now it's um you've been talking this theme of growth has come up a lot and you've been saying how we're addicted to growth um, and earlier on Fran as well um, was, was mentioning it and as was Anne. Um, and with climate scientists, there's a lot of talk that we have to reach a global target of net zero emissions. And then to answer that, there's obviously been all these big green tech billionaires and this theory of green growth, decoupling GDP from material use. Um, and then according to that theory, we can speed the whole process along by incentivizing innovation with carbon emissions and material extraction. And this is now forming like the basis of a lot of the big global plans for sustainability, like the Paris Climate Accord and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and it just seems completely mad that you will be able to replace one technology for another and somehow it's going to be green. Um, yeah, so I, I'd love, I, I wonder if you agree with that. Um, and also, um, if you have any, if you think the degrowth idea is um, a, a good and a solid one. Wow, big questions. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess as I've said, for me a key thing is scale, and I don't believe that globalization is sustainable. In other words, I believe it will end. Um, and it's interesting, actually, there's been this movie recently, hasn't there, a Planet of the Humans that Michael Moore backed, which has been extremely controversial, um, which I watched about a week ago uh, at, the, at the urging of some of the students on our course. And it, <laughs> it was really interesting because I, I wanted to like the film more than I did in that I think it's really important that we acknowledge that renewables are not some magical cure to all our problems. Um, that it's not that we can just, as I think, uh, some, some messaging has gone out to the effect that, you know, all we need to do is replace fossil fuels with renewables and then we'll live in this sort of sustainable utopia. Um, and I think that's clearly not true. Um, for a start, if we do that within a growth economy, then renewables are just gonna get sort of added to um, non-renewable energy resources rather than replacing them. However, for those who've seen that film, there's an awful lot in it which is just vastly misguided. Like what it tries to claim, for example, 
that um, basically renewables are worse than fossil fuels and you know we might as well not bother at all which I think is completely wrong um, and the solution section at the end of the film um, is extraordinarily weak so I really hope that doesn't become a figurehead for the point of view which I hold which is that renewables the problem with renewables is not that they're worse than fossil fuels they're vastly better than fossil fuels the problem with renewables is that they in no way meet up to the expectations that are being put on them that they're going to allow us to continue with a growth-based economy indefinitely into the future just by turning to a greener form of technology um, and on that level I would love to see I would love to see more critique um, what we the key to our energy problem in my opinion is it's not about energy supply the key to our energy problem is about energy demand we need to be using less energy than we're currently using and the idea that you know, we just need to predict how much energy demand the globe might want to use in future and then figure out a technological way of meeting that is completely back to front. What we need to do is look at what's possible within the ecological limits of our, of our planet um, so that we can have a future which is worth living in and then figure out how much energy we can, we can generate within those constraints and, and adjust our lifestyles accordingly. Mm, thank you, Sean. I'd love to um, ask Anne this question now because I... Um, particularly, I know, Anne, that you've got um, strong views on the type of economy that we would need, particularly when it comes to employment levels. Um, and I just wanted to ask you what kind of level of economic growth is sustainable, in your opinion, and what kind of economic activity would we require to maintain um, solidarity and community and meeting the needs of um, everybody? You're muted, Anne. I've unmuted you. Sorry, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for that. Yes, so I, I am hostile to the word growth. And the reason I'm hostile to it is because it's a neoliberal concept and it's a, very, it's a relatively new concept. And it was invented in the 1960s by the OECD and by a man called Sam Your Britain, who was the chief economist in the Financial Times. And basically what had happened was in the 1960s, the, the financial economy began to be deregulated. And if you, if you work in the financial system, basically, it's the work of speculators, right? And gambling and speculation enables you to make money very, very quickly. I mean, you buy a lottery ticket and you could earn a million bucks tomorrow, right, if you were lucky. Um, and in that sense, speculation makes capital gains, makes a gain for you, but it's effortless. It's, you know, buying a ticket and sitting on your backside and a million bucks falls into your bank account if you're lucky. But the real economy doesn't work like that. The real economy, you know, is, is much slower and has, has m many more finite limits to it. Um, but what happened was because the financial was, the economy was growing like because of speculation exponentially, these OECD economists argued that, the, you know, the real economy had to do the same to keep up or else all the effort and all the money would go into the financial economy and not into the real economy. And so they promoted the concept of growth and they wanted, they, they wanted Britain, for example, to grow by 50% within 10 years. It was a completely unsustainable target and, and crazy, but it was, it was pursued basically and gave us inflation and all kinds of instability. So I, don't, I, I feel if we use the word, we reinforce the concept. Uh, this is the whole thing about framing, which we've been taught about. That if you repeat the, the framing of your enemy, you enforce the framing of your enemy. Everyone who retweets Donald Trump reinforces Donald Trump's message, right? And I don't want to do that. I don't want us to talk about it. However, what we do know is that we have to have economic activity. And at the heart of economic activity is employment. And I'm very clear that a, a sustainable a, a Green New Deal economy has to be labor intensive. We have to substitute labor for carbon. We have to get on our bikes and use our own labor to move, basically. We've got to be far more self-sufficient. We've got to eat less and so on and so forth. And, and, and so, so for me, a, a, a green economy will be a full employment economy. Um, and I've had arguments with green MEPs and MPs, not Caroline. Caroline agrees with me, Caroline Lucas. 
But I, I, I think unemployment is a very bad thing. Humanity cannot, un, cannot bear unemployment. If you go to Egypt, where they have mass unemployment, where the youth have no chance of work, the environment is utterly degraded. Of course it is, you know, because if people don't have employment, they don't have work, they like, they don't know where they fit in society. They don't have meaning, to be honest. And work can be all kinds of things. You know, creativity is work. Teaching is work. Caring is work. And if you exclude people from doing all of those things, you exclude them from being very social, essentially. And so I, I'm, I'm again, you know, unemployment. But I also believe that it has a, a de deleterious effect on the climate, on the ecosystem. So, um, so that's all I want to say. So I don't use the term growth and I don't use the term degrowth because you're still repeating the enemy's understanding of how the economy should work. And we should not be talking with that. We should be, as Sean said, we should be talking about what we're capable of and, and the physical limits within which we have to operate. Not some dream world where we're actually we, we don't change anything, but we find an energy system to adapt to it. No, he's quite right about that. Okay, I know. Wait, I'm, I'm going to have to go soon because I have other commitments, I'm afraid. But, but I just wanted to say thank you before I go. Because oh, don't worry. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, I, um, this, if you're talking about increasing of employment, so we'd have to change the industries that the employment is relating to. Yeah, of so, course, we'd have to do far more service sector work, you know. We'd have to be caring. We'd have to be teaching. We'd have to be creating music, uh, works of art. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of work to be done in all of those spheres, and they don't necessarily have to be greenhouse gas emitting. Mm. We don't need fossil fuels to do those things. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, that we, we, it'll have to be a very different kind of economy. Mm. But we may, want, we may have to, we will have to grow our own food, for example. And there will be things we'll have to do to, to survive. But, um, yeah, no, no, it's going to have to be a very different kind of economy. But work will have to be at it, at the heart of it, in my view. That's my view. And do you think that we're going to get there through crisis? Is it going to – collapse is going to happen, then it's going to change? Or are we going to be putting the cogs into, the, into work now? Well, you know, I would much rather that we got there through reasoned ana analysis and proper mobilization and, and, and you know, a, a great sense of po politics and the fact that we need to get political. But, but it, that's not, doesn't seem to me we've got time for that right now, basically. But what we also know is that crisis is transformational. This crisis we're living through now is going to transform the economy. It already has. You know, suddenly, as Fran said, there is magic monetary. You know, we were told last year by Theresa May, our prime minister, that there was no such thing as a money, magic monetary. It turns out that austerity is a very bad thing. It's become very unfashionable. It turns out that the state is really important to our survival. The state providing health, public health, where, the, where in the United States the state refuses to provide public health, is absolutely essential to our survival. So these are all things we've suddenly become aware of, and that will change. That's going to change. Plus, the fact that we've been holed up in our homes and we've been out of touch with nature has really affected people very profoundly, I think. So I think there will be change as a result of this crisis, where there'll be enough change, sufficient change, whether, whether the financial system will change, where the Silicon Valley will change. I very much doubt, you know, we probably need a bigger shock for that to happen. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anne. And feel free to go whenever you need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Fran, I'd love to just talk to you before we take a break about um, building a roadmap out of crisis and um, particularly how positive money is approaching um, moving out of a debt growth trap or um, particular policies that you'd be keen to see, like whether that might be universal basic income. I know you mentioned it at the beginning of the call and just some of the things that you'd be particularly excited about. Sure. Um, yeah, it's been really good hearing Sean, from Sean and Anne on this. Um, so, I mean, we've actually got a new paper coming out on Monday, which is good timing, um, which is called The Tragedy of Growth. Um, really welcome everyone to tune in if you're not too zoomed out it's it's a free webinar so it's yeah if you look on our website or social media you'll find it 
um, it's 12.30. I've got some good Caroline Lucas is speaking and, and Clive Lewis, uh, good UK MPs. So, I mean, our, our kind of position is that growth is, I guess, a bit like austerity. It's a quite a key battleground in economics. And unless we fight it, we're probably not going to, um, to kind of, you know, we're going to still basically keep on this growth addiction economy where people like Boris Johnson will say, well, we have to release lockdown because we need growth because if we don't get growth, you know, it's going to be terrible and we're going to lose lots of jobs. So what we're kind of like putting out in our paper is that, you know, our kind of, the tragedy of growth is, is that it doesn't achieve any of the things people claim it achieves. And we need to kind of tackle that head on because uh, kind of mainstream um, thinking is that it's important for poverty alleviation. It's important for kind of life satisfaction, but we kind of very specifically show that it, it doesn't actually address those things. And it has all of these unintended consequences which are very problematic and it's actually a distraction from getting to where we want to go and if you look at countries that were good out of the in terms of the pandemic so New Zealand Iceland they actually also are looking to move beyond growth if you like and they both are part of the kind of global um, national I can't remember what it's called but it's kind of the well-being um, framework and they look at a dashboard of indicators so social and environmental things like life expectancy education environmental protections as just as important to them i think as gdp and what we're saying is that we we need to do we need to do that and even more than that we need to not focus at all on gdp and we need to look at actually things that matter to people's lives um but unfortunately uh you know there is a kind of reason that people are stuck on growth is that it is kind of embedded in our kind of capitalist financial economy in that if we don't have growth in the current system, then we will see rises in unemployment and rises in um, you know, food insecurity, job insecurity. So we need to look at the growth imperatives to the system in order to really transform the economy um, and get off and able to kind of restructure and then to fully abandon a kind of GDP growth as a metric and actually really focus in on social and environmental well-being. Um, and we kind of, you know, we, we focus on money and banking. So we look at the money and banking imperatives and how um, you know, interest-bearing debt is a key part of that and a key part of the capitalist system, really. And so how we kind of trans, you know, how we go beyond um, that will take a lot of different policies and a few of them I mentioned already. Um, sorry if I was going a bit fast earlier, I saw a few comments, um, but you know, feel free to follow up with questions. Um, a few of the ideas that we have are, again, around trying to kind of equalize this credit-debtor relationship. So things like uh, an ecosystem of banks rather than just having the big commercial private banks I mentioned. Um, doing monetary financing where basically um, the Bank of England um, it, you know, funds government spending, having a universal basic income, which, which by the way, I don't think is um, at odds with, for example, a job guarantee. You could have that alongside a UBI, but a universal basic income is quite key to ensure basic standard of living so you don't have this um, you know, in terms of crises occurring and are seeing now a lot of people are falling through the cracks, even with the government schemes that they've put out. You know, we're all different human beings and we all have different needs and we don't kind of fit into this um, nuclear household with like two salaries and two kids model that the government sometimes models everyone on. And I think what a UBI does is kind of have, has an equalizing effect. Other, other things we look at is a kind of digital cash. So again, something I mentioned earlier, um, so a public payment system. Um, and there, there's a few other things around, um, you know, tax reform, making sure we kind of tax assets on wealth properly, including land, which is a big issue in the UK. Um, so, if, I mean, in terms of how we, we kind of um, plot, plot our way out of this pandemic, I think the key kind of fundamental thing is that we've realized that, you know, the economy is essentially, you know, designed by humans and, and it's a set of rules and kind of structures and institutions. And there isn't any reason that they have to exist in the way that they do if they're actually making us miserable. And we kind of know that, you know, the kind of 
neoliberal economic policies, but also the individualism and the hyper-consumerist culture that's come along with that hasn't made every, anyone happier and actually is heading us on a path to, to kind of human becoming extinct and destroying the planet in the process. So really, actually, if we're going to kind of chart a different path that doesn't look to further collapse and, and further, um, you know, potentially, you know, wiping us out in the next hundred years, we need to really um, completely rethink the economy. And for us, a key kind of, um, I guess, a leverage point in that system is looking at kind of money and banking and looking at growth um, and you know, next week we're going to see figures coming out of, you know, really bad GDP predictions. But actually we're talking about saving lives and we're talking about the need to keep health and well-being of citizens um, as the priority. And I think as a society, if we can't do that, um, and if we see our politicians in the, in the UK and elsewhere kind of pushing through and just, you know, potentially releasing lockdown, potentially seeing, you know, really, really high death rates, then, you know, that's quite a scary prospect. But I think it was also highlighting the deep, deep dysfunction we have in our economy. Um, and I think that, that, you know, what this crisis has done is really brought into the table a battleground. Um, we've, I'm not allowed to say, but we've done some really good polling about how much people would um, prefer their government to prioritise GDP growth over, say, health and well-being. Um, and I think, you know, people's instincts are right. Um, if the economy isn't serving us, isn't kind of uh, making us happier or able to, able to live kind of fulfilled lives with a decent standard of living, but is actually pushing us into poverty, pushing us into kind of um, a kind of fractured society, and actually in the current um, situation, you know, it will kill people if we just lift lockdown because of GDP. Then I think we kind of bring into focus the fact that we do need to really drastically change things. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there because I realise I've gone on no, for no. a little bit. I just wanted to, in, so in the aftermath of kind of decades of neoliberal emphasis on individualistic competition, it's asking a lot um, to suddenly change. And it's asking for a big shift in value systems as well as economic systems. And I just wonder what sort of, what do you think we need to do to foster the social and cooperative values that would be necessary to support the shift that you've been discussing and we've all been discussing? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, the kind of, the good thing is, is that, um, you know, we can see the, the economy, society and, and culture are so intrinsically linked as, as well as with the environment. Um, and so, you know, some of the policies that I've been talking about actually kind of force us into a kind of reassessment of, of, of values and who we are. And for me, you know, when the big, when it kind of the shock of what was happening and unfolding with the pandemic struck in March, it, at the same time as obviously you know, being deeply concerned, I felt like there were, you know, I felt a kind of um, hope that actually this is a chance for us to realise our collectivity, our in interdependence of on each other, our understanding that my health is reliant on my neighbour's health and me getting better is reliant on an NHS that is publicly funded and, and, and actually, um, you know, a, a kind of bringing into the spotlight um, values that are very opposed in a way to the ones that we've been told by the kind of mainstream thinking, which is, you know, we're all individuals, there's no such thing as a society and competition and profit and money are the kind of top things that we should all be working towards. And in, and in this crisis, you know, all of those go out the window. And what matters is community, what matters is, is the key workers that obviously are, have been kind of demonised and are on, often on poverty wages, whether they're the waste collectors, the carers, you know, NHS um, porters or, or nurses. Um, and so it really has kind of the possibility to flip our values. And what you can see is obviously, you know, the government really trying to kind of double down on its control over the narrative. Um, but, you know, I'm, I guess I'm, I, I'm an optimist and I hope and I think that it might not happen tomorrow, it might happen the day after, you know, lockdown is kind of released. But I think in the years and months ahead, 
this is having a deep effect on our and our collective kind of psychology, if you like, as a society. And I think that that can't, um, you know, can't not have a big impact on how we kind of see ourselves as individuals, as, as communities and of, of societies and countries in the world. Um, you know, obviously I'm hopeful that it shifts us towards a more collectivist um, society that has values of solidarity, of justice, of fairness, of compassion. Um, but also, you know, I'd say that the things that we're pushing, like a universal basic income, um, you know, uh, are more kind of um, bringing the kind of financial sector under control and making it work for the public. Those are all um, things that actually most people want instinctively. They're not really that radical. It's like, oh, can the banks, like, can they just do some good and like not just cause financial crisis and make rich people richer? Like most people agree I think some of the issues that, that we have in terms of getting, you know, the right people elected, and as Anne was saying, you know, politics is not a nice area. I was, I was in it, I ran for election last year, and I kind of can see why, um, you know, it's difficult to kind of get people with those values into politics. But I do think as the system crumbles, there's a lot more gaps and cracks for um, new voices to be heard and to... Um, you know, a different kind of narrative to come through. Um, I don't think it's straightforward, but I think that, you know, all of these things are together, are kind of work together. So it, it's around kind of seeing the fact that they're interlinked to, and, and kind of one thing that we've done at Positive Money is put our values front and centre, which is um, fairness, democracy and sustainability and enable everything we do to kind of flow from that. Um, and I think that, um you know what what we're going to see in terms of the the trend the kind of um coming out of the pandemic and the the weeks and months and potentially years ahead is that is that nothing is kind of you can't kind of think of any, anything in isolation um because everything feeds into each other so if you get that like banking reform it's actually connected to of whether we kind of move towards values of solidarity versus individualism and it you know it's all kind of connected yeah. It is amazing the solidarity that we've seen come out of the crisis um, and there's been people have been talking a lot recently about Rebecca Solnit's book Paradise Made in Hell that talks about um, how crisis can bring out our best and Sean's waving his hands. <laughs> yeah it's a really good book um, and there's another essay that I read called, um, by someone called Ulrich Beck who um, talks about emancipatory emancipatory um, catastrophism, which talks about how crisis is point of fundamental transformation and fertile moments for progressive, really structural change. Um, and it's also quite ironic because suddenly the coronavirus is making us see these cracks in the system, but it's not like they were never there. Um, it's people have been living in abject, um, kind of human rights violations worldwide, globally, um, forever. And it's just taken the coronavirus for it to suddenly be bringing front, right and centre of our daily conversations. But in reality, they should have been there a long time ago. And I think it really is our duty to find a new way, a new, a new path forwards to talk not about going back to normal or what the new normal is, but an alternative um, direction. And, and, and we are presented now with such an opportunity and the fact that people are talking about it, we can judge that why wasn't being spoken about before, but the fact that everybody is talking about it is something, um, such an opportunity and um, for fertile uh, change. Um, but I'm aware we've been talking for a very long time, so I want to suggest um, a short break and then we're going to come back to the room and break up into some groups to talk in smaller groups about some of the topics that have arisen um, and we'll pose a question to each of the breakouts and then we'll open up for questions with um, Sean and Fran. So um, it's now 10 to 9, so we'll come back here um, at 5 to 9, so just six minutes, um, if that's okay with everybody. And if you're feeling quite overwhelmed, um, 
it might be nice just to write some reflections down, just what comes up. Um, nobody will be asked to share anything, just if anything's kind of bubbling under the surface, just writing some notes or um, whatever you feel called to do. Uh, so we'll come back here in about six minutes. I was reminded by some comments in the chat um, from Jamie and then Sean replied um, that it was so recent. This time last year, just a few weeks ago, was during Extinction Rebellion. Um, and it feels like a whole other world away um, from when we were able to gather in large numbers and protest and at least have that sense of agency that comes when everybody comes together in places that you're not allowed and in protest of the system and at least you can have your voice heard and what's so difficult about the times we're in now is that we're in crisis but we're alone at home in front of a computer screen and how can we navigate this sense of agency um, and yeah so I just wanted to bring Jamie's question that was in the chat into our whole group conversation. So I'm just gonna read it out from my phone. Um, and he said, what can citizens do to change things and keep a sense of agency in these scary times, but also in the coming years when the system starts to break down due to climate and ecological collapse? Other than nonviolent direct action, is it about thinking globally and acting locally? And he said, maybe for sure on that question. So, there's Sean. There, am I with you now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was, I was uh, on the wrong mode. <laughs> um, yeah, well, this is actually a lot what we were just talking about in our, in our breakout room um, agency. I mean, the first thing I always say to people when they're like, what can we do, is connect with others. Because um, I remember, I mean, I started telling that story about 15 years ago, and at that time I was really just, researching all this stuff on the internet and I didn't have any peer group around it and all my friends thought I was completely insane to be quitting my job to try and work on this stuff and living really cheaply which has been my approach for the last 15 years to spend all my time doing stuff I'm passionate about rather than spending it earning money and um and just that feeling of being alone with the apocalypse that feeling of like ah <laughs> like this is all falling apart but nobody even seems to acknowledge that it's happening and what do we do and it was such a transformative thing for me. Again, that course that I mentioned in 2006, because I suddenly had a peer group. And I suddenly had people I could connect with and work with and cry with and plot with. And just connection is so important. And as you say, Extinction Rebellion was one thing. I mean, people often are very critical of sort of protest marches and stuff. And I am in terms of their effect on transforming change politically, but they can be incredibly nourishing just as ways to connect with other people and feel a sense of solidarity, I find sometimes. Um, but I, I mean, this sort of ties in with what Fran was saying just before the breakout rooms as well, that, you know, all these issues are interconnected. And on the one hand, as she was saying, you know, that means if we can change one thing, like an element of the financial system, that, that sort of ripples outwards very positively. But it can also be very, um, stultifying I think when you feel like everything's connected to everything else and most of the decisions that are being made are really bad ones <laughs> um, and so the whole thing can seem like this huge interconnected mass of injustice uh, and foolishness um, and in some ways there's hope I think in these times with regard to that as well which is that we may be used to thinking of this as being this vast Goliath system that you know we can't even imagine being able to change and right now we're in a situation where we know that radical change is coming because there are two options. We either radically change direction or we end up where we're headed, which is going to look radically different from today. So either way, radical change is coming and where we're headed is going to look especially different for relatively comfortable folk who get to take part in webinars like this. Um, so, you know, let's, let's remember that all things move towards their end. Change is inevitable and continuous. And the question is not, how do we overthrow the system? The question is, how do we most effectively intervene in a system which is going through radical change about our ears? Um, and we often talk about resilience. And I think 
people often have a sort of mistaken idea of resilience, that resilience is predicting the future the best we can and preparing for that. And I don't think that's what resilience is. I think what resilience is, is looking at the widest possible range of possible futures and doing the thing that makes sense across the widest possible range of possible futures, not the one we predict, because predictions about the future are always wrong to some degree or another, like none of us are, are prophets. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of, in terms of interconnection, I think, I think that's really the thing is like, you know, webinars like this, I mean, I, I'm not lonely at all right now because I'm in the middle of this, this two month course, which is, which is leaving me perpetually connected to people all over the world. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, I think that, you know, we are figuring out what protest and resistance and the creation of alternatives looks like in a, in a, in a sort of lockdown world. Um, and just like Naomi Klein often says, like our role is to prepare for the moments when change happens incredibly rapidly um, and have the alternative stories ready for people to grab hold of. And I think right now we're in one of those moments where things are changing incredibly rapidly. Like the financial economy has changed more in the last two months than it's probably changed in the past decade. Um, and so this is really the time when all these brilliant ideas that we've been frustratingly going, ah, oh, we know how to fix this, but we just don't know how to make it happen. Like this is the time to really shout about those ideas, to really talk to each other, to really connect, because this is the time when people are suddenly going, oh, wait, we really can't carry on as we were. Oh. I love that about your, um, the name of your blog being Dark Optimism because it kind of brings into that thing of the, sh the shadow side and um, how we can work with that to kind of take us forward in a much more rounded and full understanding of what change is. Yeah, I mean, that sort of came out because, I mean, bright, shiny optimism just winds me up a bit, to be honest, because I'm like, well, everything isn't fine. Like, it really isn't. Like, you're not paying attention if you think everything's fine. Um, but at the same time, in difficult times, there are still always things we can do to make things better than they would otherwise be. Um, like at the moment, you know, we, we've been talking about things like how do we make sure that everyone's secure during the transition to a, a, a fairer system. I would say that we can't. Um, you know, there has never been a time when everyone was secure. There probably will never be a time when everyone's secure. And we're moving into a period when the consequences of years, arguably centuries of, of short-termist destructive thinking are, sort of coming home to roost. I think, you know, we are genuinely moving into a, a really difficult period of history. Like there's, a, there's an old Irish joke, like well, where are you trying to get to? Oh, Tipperary. Ah, I wouldn't start from here. And, you know, we can build all the, all the visions we want of, of where we want to be, but like, by God, I wish we weren't starting from where we are. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's, it's really important that actually my friend, my friend Mark Boyle has a lovely line about this. He says, because he's, he's a bit of a Luddite and he's sort of living, living without high technology at the moment. And people often accuse him of romanticizing the past. Uh, and he said in his recent book, The Way Home, um, you know, it's true, you know, more labor intensive ways of life, like Anne was talking about, are really difficult. You know, they're, they're bloody and they're mucky and they're difficult. But the real danger is people who romanticize the future. Um, because if we imagine that things are just going to go on some sort of techno utopia vision, then we're going to be deeply unprepared for the kind of future that, not that really that I'm predicting, but that is already unfolding. Um, the science fiction writer William Gibson said something that I quote all the time, which is, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, like, if we look around the world, it, it's mad when people ask me, like, oh, well, where's your collapse then, mate? You know, like, collapse has already happened for the majority of the human world and the majority of the non-human world. Like we, we, we're in, we're living in a period of genocide and ecocide. Um, and so the question for me is not how do we make sure that everyone's secure? Because I think that's impossible, but the aim is the right one. The aim is how do we, how do we create a secure future for as many as possible? And again, I would come back to for me, the place to look for that is not finance, which is why I actually have some misgivings about universal basic income. Like I'm, I'm in, intrinsically attracted to it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my work was around squatting rights, for example, because I think one of the great injustices of our society is that people have to basically sell their labor for the majority of their life just in order to have a place to live, like a place to exist. 
Um, no other species on the planet has that situation. Every other species is allowed to just make itself a place to live and live there, but we're not. Um, and so I'm intrinsically attracted to the idea of, well, let's just give people the essentials of what they need to live and then they can choose what to do with their life. Completely on board with that. What I find dangerous in it, arguably, and that I don't think it's talked about that much yet. And incidentally, I think UBI is going to come. I think it's going to be an outcome of, of uh, the situation that we're in. So I'm now starting to think about what might be the, the dangers of that being co-opted. Um, and one thing is that it does create this sense that, it, that if we see UBI as the source of our security, then again, it's monetary. It's the idea that what we're dependent on is finance, not on relationships, not on culture, not on nature. Um, and it's centralized. So whoever it is, whether it's the government or whoever that, that, that sends this monetary income to each of us, it's again creating this sense of, oh, here I am receiving what I need from some centralized power rather than a sense of collaborative bottom-up power where we collectively create that which we need in partnership with nature. Um, and so I think we need to be a bit wary about UBI. As I say, I'm, I'm intrins I, I have mixed feelings about it, but I think if, if it's going to happen, which I think it is, then we have to be really careful about the way that we frame it so that it doesn't just get seen as like, oh, great, well, I've got the financial income that I need, so I'll just carry on living a consumerist lifestyle and the government will provide and I can go back to sleep. Um, and I, I, yeah, there isn't time for us to get into that more, but as I say, for me, if we're looking at how we provide real security for, for human and non-human people, um, the real answer has to come in, in the only economic system that's ever worked. What is that? Well, it's, it's not capitalism. It's not communism. Again, on my definition of economics, the only economic system that's ever worked is nature. Um, Aldo Leopold in his San County Almanac describes biology as the study of animal economics, which of course, if we see economics as being what we do and how we spend our time and who gets what resources makes perfect sense, which means that biology is actually the study, the economic study of the only economic system that's ever worked, which not many traditional economists agree with me about, but I find interesting. Yeah. And, and of course, nature is grounded in, not in competition and red in tooth and claw, but nature is grounded in non-monetary relationships and reciprocities and cooperation across species, which is exactly what human cultures were built on for the majority of our existence. And it's getting back to those systems that really work, like non-monetary relationships and nature that I think is going to provide a secure future for us all, um, just like it has for almost all of human history, rather than reform of the financial economy, which I wholeheartedly support but think is unlikely to happen given or unlikely to happen on the scale necessary given the powers that be and the concentrations of wealth that we have in the world um and is far more likely to continue with its own short-termist omnicidal path up to the point where it collapses under the weight of what Anne was talking about when it basically makes too many promises can't keep them and people lose faith in the whole monetary system and it falls about our ears um so yes, uh, I think I think I made a co coherent point there that we need to get away from money as the focus of yeah. where we're looking for our security. I think it's interesting that the root of um, the word economy is in that word house or home from the Greek, which is then the same as ecology. Um, and it's funny that our whole financial system is built around the idea that the money and the environment aren't related when embedded within the language is just that root of their interrelationships. Um, I'm going to hand over to Christopher because she's got some questions from everybody in the audience. So some more questions. Thank you, Sean. Um, I wanted to know if maybe Fran had any comments on UBI because there was quite a lot of um, questions about that in the comment box. I also have another question for Fran um, from someone which says, could you talk a bit more about banks lending to socially beneficial projects? How could that work? How could the projects be selected and so on? Could that work without without an overhaul of the current system, which might take time. Great, excellent conversation. Um, as you were saying that, I was literally just reading this article that's come out today from the um, Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in, in Finland, who have been doing UBI. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the, it, it's kind of all, again, linked together. Um, I think I, I agree with Sean to an extent that this idea of 
of kind of focusing in on on money as a as a means to um, uh, kind of you know be our security isn't a kind of is a dangerous path to go down if you link that in with an individualistic and hyper consumerist society but I think that that if you look at the kind of basic human needs clearly there's security you know we all need to eat we need to put a roof over our heads um and you know that's actually not that um easy to do in in some of the richest countries in the world like the uk and actually you know what ubi does it is put more power in into citizens or to workers um and less into employers whilst we are trapped in this um system which 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 is where most of the kind of wealth most of the means of production most of the jobs are concentrated and 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 um workers rights have been eroded slowly over the last few decades so you know there is very little economic security and i think ebi is an important part but obviously it's absolutely not the only thing so um somebody in the comments wrote about universal basic services i think they're very they're key too so thinking about you know excellent tr um, public services transport that are low carbon that are free healthcare that isn't um being privatized which is is actually what we're seeing in the uk um at the moment you know this this crisis this pandemic is working it as a um to actually mean that there's more stealth privatization going on so i think we can't get around the fact that this the structures we have in the economy um have you know very big impacts on human well-being and it just isn't acceptable that for example a carer in the uk um at the moment you know in such a high risk job is getting paid you know nine pounds an hour with a zero hour contract um isn't you know has kind of no power um and isn't able to to feed the family without going to a food bank like that's just not acceptable and it's going to be very difficult for us to to transform um unless we kind of and actually to organize and um unless we have more citizens who feel um you know have that kind of basic security um and and so that's why i do think you know actually ubi can be quite a could be quite a transformational thing i think if it got implemented under the current kind of conservative government in the uk you know it would probably be a uh, a kind of insignificant amount so it wouldn't actually be transformative but if it was enough to cover your kind of basic cost of living then it could be um thinking about the banking system question so yes there are already banks that exist that have kind of hardwired into their mission um social environmental um kind of aspects so Triados, you might have heard, it's kind of originated in the Netherlands, but it's across um, Europe and, and has a, 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 a kind of this significant um, bank here. You can bank with Triados if you live in the UK. Um, they, they have done some really excellent projects to show, I mean, their whole kind of lending portfolio has to be socially or environmentally um, kind of conscious for them to lend to a project so you know they're kind of showing that it can be done and you can make a profit um you know they, they're still profit um making organization however you know they don't have um extreme kind of bonuses they don't have like a reckless culture a lot of the problems that you see with the, the big banks i was talking about earlier um you know, it isn't just in their shareholder model, but it's in the kind of lack of any kind of purpose apart from the bottom line and making lots of money. Um, so, you know, I think they kind of, and also somebody mentioned earlier on about Germany having a good banking system. It, it does, it has like state banks, um, but it also has regional banks, the Sparkassen who lend locally and regionally to ensure that, you know, a diverse range of projects get funded. Um, so I think, you know, the key is that there isn't any silver bullet. And I think sometimes, you know, we can get we can get too fixated on, well, that's maybe good in this way, but it's problematic in these ways. And and I think, you know, actually um there isn't going to be anything that is a kind of quick fix. And we are going to probably see still, as much as there might be some big changes, there's also going to be a lot of incremental change, but that's stuff we can kind of take hope from 
Um, you know, so when we see a lot of MPs signing up to UBI as an idea, that can be, you know, hope. When we see mission-driven banks, that can be kind of, you know, there is possibility. And I think it can feel overwhelming that there is so much wealth and power concentrated in the hands of so few. But actually, um, you know, I do think that the the kind of system crumbling um, and the and the status quo has shifted in terms of, you know, uh, over the last kind of few years and decade really since the crash to mean that, that that's not really acceptable by the mainstream anymore. And I, you know, I do think we're headed and I don't know how it's all going to pan out um, and it could, you know, could be terrible, but I think there's also you know, I still have a lot of hope in the human race and um, a kind of instinct of um, of values that are, are needed in this time of like collectivism and solidarity. Thank you so much. Um, I've got now two, quest two questions. I'm going to ask them at the same time and then maybe um, you both want to jump in, maybe focusing on one of them each. Um, Lisa says, fascinating stuff. I'm usually almost actively disinterested in anything to do with money and economics. So I apologize if this is a really dull question, but I don't think I understand why it is the problem to just stop economic growth. What would physically happen that is such a terrible problem to everybody? Part two of that question, of not from someone else though, different question, is what's the perspective here on systems change within banking finance in regards to blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies? So I don't know who wants yeah, to. I can, I can jump in that. Can you just quickly repeat the second one? Um, yes, sorry. What's, what's the perspective here on system change within banking and okay. finance in regards to blockchain technology? Okay, cool. So yeah, I'll try and be brief. Um, so... Um, I'll take the blockchain first and, and obviously there's no stupid question um, for the first one so I'll talk about growth second so I mean um, I think block you know I'm not not definitely not a blockchain expert but obviously it's been um, made kind of very famous by Bitcoin and I think one of the big problems with Bitcoin is obviously it or well not obviously but um, if you look into it and, and as much as we have, then it, it kind of has been a, another place where it's turned into an asset, a speculative asset where there was kind of a boom and a bust and lots of people lost lots of money. And that's not really as, as we kind of see useful as a, as a means of payment. Um, so I think blockchain technology in a distributed ledger is interesting. And it's something that we've looked a little bit into when thinking about how you might design a public payment system. Um, I know there's an interesting um, organization in the Netherlands, I think they're called Dyn, that are looking at kind of a public digital cash, I think the blockchain technology. Um, for, for, for us, it's always power accountability um, questions, like who, who has the power to create money, who kind of gets to design it, see where it goes, and like the political economy questions are, are kind of fundamental. And the technology kind of follows that. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's a, a bit on blockchain. It's, I don't think it's good necessarily or bad. It's it's kind of neutral and you know, it has potential to be both, depending on who's using it and then what interests. I think so. Trying to answer the growth question simply, um, if we so what we're going to see over the next um, kind of few months and, and the statistics that come out from the GDP figures is a contraction of the economy. So that's just like less economic activity. Um, so less people buying stuff, less goods and services being sold. Um, now the problem with that is something that Anne spoke a bit about. And yeah, she still often says she disagrees with us, but often I find us saying the same thing. So I always find her quite a confusing one. But but we, we both find agree on the principle of if you stop if banks stop lending money but people keep paying back their debt the amount of money in the system contracts so we have a smaller amount of money going around um, now the problem with that is is that you know we, we tip into a, a recession and a depression and if you don't have um, a, a kind of safety net which covers everyone's um, you know basic standard of living and um, then you kind of quite quickly um, can kind of, in a way, tip out of control into a kind of downward spiral of, of increase in unemployment, increased poverty, and people continually defaulting on their debts, 
Um, and this can have you know, big reverberations and you can have a kind of debt deflation situation where basically um, you know, the economy is kind of running down out of control. So, so the, some of the policies we're trying to bring in would mean that you could contract the economy, but actually everyone would still maintain a standard of living that we need. So we'd still be able to put food on the table, have shelter, use free public transport, you know, have meaningful and fulfilled low carbon lives um, and and to to enable that to happen without these kind of big crises happening we do need some structural changes um, and so that's what we're advocating in this paper that we're releasing on Monday um, is, is around some of those financial ones but it's definitely not a uh, it's not a super question at all. It's, an, in fact, probably that the most difficult question of kind of economics and, and in a way why a lot of mainstream economists don't really want to think about a non-growing economy because they're like, oh, there's just crises and we don't know how to deal with them, so we just need to grow. But, you know, we're going to see that we're in an unavoidable crisis in the next you know, months and, and years ahead. Um, and I'm going to launch a personal rebellion against mansplaining by not endeavouring to add too much to that because Fran knows far more about both these topics than I do. Um, but I would say that, you know, some of the things that could potentially happen in a, in a financial collapse situation are like pensions losing all their value. So people not having that source of income, um, indeed money losing its value so that your savings, you know, disappear through inflation, which is something that's happened in various places in the world. Um, and possibly people there being so much unemployment that government aren't able to support all the people who are in unemployment anymore. Um, but it's completely valid to say, well, surely those things are less bad than a, an ecologically dead planet. That would be a completely valid point um, that, you know, economic collapse is less bad than ecological collapse in the grand scheme of things, I would say. And the, the only other thing I'll say is that, um, this book, which the quotes that I've quoted from David Fleming are from this book, Surviving the Future by David Fleming, which, which I edited after he died. And it is actually the best answer I've found to that question, the, the, the question I sort of framed at the start. If we keep growing, we collapse. If we don't keep growing, we collapse. So what on earth do we do? Um, and it's the best. The reason I gave years unpaid to bring it to publication after he died is because it's the best answer I've found to well, what on earth do we do about that situation um, and talks about the perils of, of collapse and um, what a post, well, what, what a society that's less focused on the need for growth would look like. Um, so I wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone who wants to explore these things more. It's also not at all written in economic, uh, economics la language. It's a very accessible and warm book. Thank you, Sean. And we've got time for one more um, question, um, which is: I think one of those pred possible predictable future. I think one of those possible predict predictable futures is a furthering of right-wing ideology and regressive policies around the world, potentially leading to fascism. Do you have any ideas on how to intertwine the politics of the anti-fascist struggle into work around changing economics, etc.? Uh, shall I start with that one, Fran? Sure. We'll pick up. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, actually a piece that I shared a link to in the chat a bit earlier, and I will do once I'm, I'm done talking, kind of addresses this very much, because I think, um, it's a short way of saying it, I think our current, um, our current globalised sort of neoliberal system is not only destroying our collective future, it's also kind of all but destroyed the present for many um, through things like austerity that Fran was talking about. And I think as we've seen sort of at the time, hugely unexpected election results around the world, like, like Trump in the US, like the Brexit vote, Corbyn being elected as, as Labour prime uh, Labour leader as well, um, Bolsonaro in Brazil, like those might seem strange things to lump in together but I would say that all of them were a kind of expression of a desperate rejection of the status quo. Um, I think there are an awful lot of people who just find that um, how things are is, is, is not acceptable and not good for them for all sorts of reasons. And as the questioner rightly, rightly implies, like in such times when people are more and more struggling, 
and losing faith in the kind of dominant collective story as of what's important, the far right absolutely has a track record of providing kind of um, tempting answers. Uh, and it's, you know, it's really important to remember that, that the likes of Mussolini and Hitler, they didn't only consolidate power on the basis of, of, of lies and, and fear mongering and scapegoating. They also raised wages and they addressed unemployment and they improved working conditions. And so I think if we are going to effectively challenge this drift into fascism, which is absolutely a, a, a possible future um, and, you know, arguably a, a feature of our present, then what we need is to present an alternative kind of politico-economic vision that can restore identity and pride and economic well-being. And I think that's the work that, that Fran and Anna and myself are all, all engaged with. That's, that's why we've been invited to this, because what we're trying to do is tell a beautiful story of how we're going to make the future better for the desperate rather than a, than a fearful one. Um, because if we don't provide a grounding alternative to that, then, uh, sorry, a compelling grounded alternative to that sort of right wing vision, then history teaches us that that's, um, that very often comes through in really difficult times. Um, so I just really, again, it comes back to that quote I did from Naomi Klein earlier, that, you know, we need to now, shout about the the alternative economic and political visions that we have um whether whether that's david fleming's work whether that's Franz's work Anne's work a hundred other people that we're probably all inspired by um and want to work i think that's absolutely the key to undermining this story that in difficult times what we need to do is reject the other um i think absolutely what we need is 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 a more of an approach of of collectivity and solidarity um yeah and i think i think politically that's the key to challenging the spread of fascism uh, yeah should i jump in a little bit um i mean i definitely feel like it's yeah it's it's quite scary when you see you know boris johnson in charge in the uk trump in charge in the us um, bolsonaro is brazil um and you know, the kind of politics that they they obviously put out is not just a politics of propaganda. We're seeing, you know, how how our own government here in the UK is really trying to control the media narrative um, and tell a good story uh, rather than the story that, you know, how uh, in the UK we've got the worst death rate in Europe. Um, but also the, the politics of division and hate. Um, uh, you know, and I'd say Boris Johnson is, you know, he's he's on a he's heading towards a Nigel Farage in terms of a, a far right kind of um, rhetoric. You know, he's he's um, incredibly kind of racist, homophobic, um, Islamophobic in, in a lot of the things he said. And that's really dangerous. And obviously with COVID-19, what we've seen, um, well, in the UK and the US for sure, I'm sure it's the same elsewhere, is that... Um, is that black, Asian, minority, ethnic people are disproportionately dying at like high rates. And there, you know, there are a few reasons for this. There's the fact that um, in, in the UK, they're disproportionately high in terms of health workers. So there's, I think they make up 44% of the uh, NHS staff despite being uh, you know, less than 20% of the population. They are uh, obviously disproportionately affected by poverty. And also, um, you know, there are massive health biases. So if you go into hospital and you're black, you're, you're less likely to get the treatment you need. That's just a fact. Um, and this is one of the key things that we need to understand coming out of this crisis. You know, there's, there's you know, still a, a, a lot of um, naivety, you know, maybe you could call it ignorance in the kind of progressive uh, transformative economy left-wing maybe mo social justice movement and uh, in, in the UK and across the world on on, on kind of structural oppression uh, not just race but class gender um, and obviously international uh, the kind of international aspects of this as well um, so I do think if we're really going to kind of collectively um, uh, you know, kind of be a force against the the alt right, the far right, the um, the, the fascists, and um, and potentially some of the like worst political leaders in in modern well in in kind of the last uh, few hundred years. Then we need to really get to grips with with structural oppression, with our own 
um, you know, privileges and, and with the fact that we aren't all treated differently. Uh, we are all treated differently in it and it, and that's kind of key. Um, but I do think there's a lot, there's like a, uh, a lot of hope the other side, because ev- again, everything starts, um, to kind of be a bit clearer once you can kind of see things as again through structural oppression lenses it's like you know Sean talked about kind of figuring out about the economy and that can be one layer and then you kind of look at the kind of political layer and that's another one and and then thinking about structural oppression and that's another one and I think that it's it's such a key to understanding the times we're in and the kind of the power dynamics and the the very you know dark as well forces that are, are um, around is um, is kind of deep entrenched um, racism and uh, classism and, and sexism um, and, and you know other uh, other kind of structures of, of oppression. So so it's really key um, that we kind of embrace that as part of the new economy challenges <laughs> thank you um so much fran and um that was a really good way to end the conversation because we're going to be exploring all of this next week um in the next session um where we're going to be looking at how we can um achieve the changes required in a way that can promote justice and equality um, and repair the try and repair some of the historical oppression of frontline and vulnerable communities around the world, um, and how that the structural change that we're working for and that's required doesn't strengthen the hands of those who already use their power to um, exploit and oppress. Um, so, just want to thank you both so much. Um, we should be wrapping up now, um, but. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been such a deep and a rich conversation. I'm trying to think back to how we started exploring where money comes from, the financial system and credit, um, debt and growth, degrowth, um, to the more kind of psychological and social context, communities, um, what else did we touch on? Our ways out of crisis or ways into crisis, um, yeah so we've just talked through so much and um thank you both for your time and to everybody who's been with us for bringing so much insight into the conversation um and such great questions in the q a and um i've loved seeing every all the suggestions um, that popped up so we're going to collate everything that's been in the chat and pick out all of the links and all of the book recommendations and also put in all of the books that, um, at, that Fran, Sean and Anne have mentioned as well and send that out tomorrow, um, hopefully, with a link to the conversation we had this evening so then everyone can watch it before next week again um, if you want to catch up. Particularly some of the more technical parts of the conversation, if you felt they were a bit hard to understand, then that would be an opportunity to like go over it again. Um, and yeah so thanks everyone if you've got any questions you've all got my email because i wrote to everyone again this afternoon so just feel free to reach out and um also for feedback so that we can respond and then make the next weeks as we go on um better so yeah so thanks a lot and re- remember that you cannot not change the world whatever yeah. you do is going to make things different than they would otherwise have been so never buy the story that you can't change the world you cannot not change the world <laughs>